All right, everybody. Um, well, thanks for coming this morning. Uh, we have the, the pleasure uh, to have our visiting professor today for, for, for Spine, who's uh, Wellington Sioux. Um, I know the residents, uh, you guys got a chance to meet him a little bit last night, um, but also hopefully some, some, as the faculty kind of come in, they can uh, also uh, garner some, some, some tips and tricks from, from Dr. Sue. Um, we feel really, really, pleased to have a, a guy like Wellington come in. We, we've been, I've known Wellington now for, for since I've started practice and, and, um, and he's one of those guys that, uh, that, you've, that I've always looked up to. Oh, you know, ever since I started practice, you'd see, I'd see Wellington up on, the, up on the stage giving his talks and, and you always wanted to be just like Wellington. You know, just, just like Mike. Um, which is, which is the first part. The second part to this is that you never wanted to follow Wellington when you're up there speaking either. Because as you'll see, his presentations are, are, are amazing. And, um, and he's just an amazing person, an amazing guy. And um, I wish that we got more of a chance for you guys to interact with him. Um, but uh, but I, I think that we'll get a really good second hour today as well for the residents. Um, you know, Wellington uh, is a couple years ahead of me in practice. Um, we're actually the same age. I'm a little bit older than him, and he had a little bit of time off between uh, during his training. Um, but he grew up in Wisconsin. Um, he uh, had some pretty uh, significant, uh, distinguished awards uh, in high school um, that led him to where he is today. Um, he's got. Um, he did his residency at UCLA. He did his training in Madison, Wisconsin, um, and knows a lot of the guys there that. Uh, that Dr. Brocky actually trained with uh, back in the back in the day as well, um, and then uh, started on staff at Northwestern and has been there ever since, um, and hasn't hasn't gone anywhere. Um, not only is he an amazing surgeon, but the way that he thinks about things, the way that he um, is able to uh, you know put forth all of his efforts and research. Um, as you can see, he's the director of research at Northwestern and and does really amazing. Uh, things not only from a clinical standpoint, but also from a basic science standpoint. Um, and his wife uh, works works with him as, the, as a PhD in, in the lab, and he does some pretty cool um, basic science research, which I'm sure he'll touch on a little bit today. Um, and so it's it's a it's an amazing uh, it's amazing to have him here. Um, he's a great friend. He's a great person. He's a great dad. Um, if you get a chance to talk to him about his kids at some point, you know, if you ever see him at a meeting, it's, it's amazing to hear all the things that they're doing as well. Um, and so with that, Wellington, you've got the floor. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Brandon. All right. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Brandon. Um, it's interesting as he was like saying all these really nice things about me, I was thinking I, I would actually say the exact same thing about Brandon uh, over, over the years that we've known each other. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I know you guys only have one visiting press professor per year, and I feel very honored to be uh, that uh, that individual this year. Um, I wish I had uh, you know a lot of time to talk about the faculty here um, and how much respect I have for all of the spine folks. Uh, you know, I've been in practice for about 14 years now, and it's been a remarkable sort of journey that Utah has undergone in the last decade. Uh, now you've got one of the, uh, the foremost uh, chairs uh, in the world uh, at a program in a location that is like no other. And um, I'll, ta I'll tell you these, these four spine guys that you have here, not only are they great surgeons, but um, you guys are really lucky to have them as role models. Um, you know, uh, the way that surgeons conduct their life, that the choices that they make for 
their families and work and how they treat patients and how they teach people. I can't think of a, a more prominent group and um, uh, every member of the, of, the, of the group I've had so much fun with and so, uh, and, and so much respect for. And so I also hope Brandon a lot because uh, you know that the ski experiences uh, I, I've always enjoyed. I'm a snowboarder. Everybody else is a skier in this picture. But some of the most amazing ski experiences I've had um, are, are with Brandon. He's created these opportunities, uh, and I hope that they will continue um, uh, foremost in the future as well. Um, I'm proud to uh, sort of uh, introduce Joe Weiner, who is going to be your spine fellow in a matter of months, and he's one of the finest. Uh, Northwestern residents that have ever come from our program. We have never had a Northwestern resident train at this program. I consider Utah to be the, the best fellowship in the country. So I feel very lucky that we are, have opened that pipeline um, and uh, hope to have uh, many, many more. So um, I'll talk about spinal biologics today. It's a, an area of research interest that I've had um, for, for years since, my, since the start of my career. I have a couple of uh, relevant disclosures here. In particular, Ampix Bio is the, uh, the third-party entity that owns a lot of the intellectual property that I'll be talking about. I do have ownership in this stake. But I'll be talking about spinal biologics in, in general um, and, and touching on a couple of research aspects. And I also have some disclosures with uh, consulting on advisory boards for uh, industry partners in the space as well. Okay, so when we talk about spinal biologics, um, we have to think about the benefactors. Uh, even though entire careers have been built on this topic, the reason we're in it is because the patients who need fusions need to have good outcomes. So if we have good, uh, good fusion rates and good success rates when it comes to that, then outcomes can be improved. And in that respect, uh, you know, patients will do well. But then there are many candidates. So there are a number of products on the market that uh, propose uh, the ability to, to achieve a fusion. Allograft, DBM, synthetics. We were not going to go through all of these topics, um, but there are a lot of choices. But not all these choices are great. Some are good and, and some aren't good. And then we have to think about the players. Uh, surgeons want to use a specific biologic because they think it works. Uh, industry wants to move their product forward. Hospitals don't want to pay as much money for these biologics. And so there's an evolution of other aspects of biologics that we have to think about when we bring a new product to market as well. Um, I do about 75% minimally invasive cases, and I think that minimally invasive surgery is a huge boon for many patients if we can get them out of the hospital a little bit quicker. I don't think that minimally invasive surgery leads to better long-term outcomes, but as a MIS surgeon, if you're quicker with the operation and you can provide just the same amount of outcome with quicker recovery, then you're doing better for the patient. The problem is when you do an MIS case, there is a higher threshold or a higher need for biologics in that environment. You have limited access, you don't have autographed, uh, the handling properties would be very critical in delivering some uh, material through a two a centimeter tube. And so you're gonna be asking more from your biologic at that point. Furthermore, um, a lot of the complex surgery here uh, uh, applies to this, but many of the inpatient, or sorry, the, the re-admissions uh, from inpatients are coming from sewer arthrosis. There's, so there's a significant cost involved if you do a big operation and achieve a non-union or a sewer arthrosis. So there's a, a huge need in the market for better biologics, not only now, but uh, in the future. As I spoke about, there are many different products on the market that you have to choose from, and there are a number of different categories that it helps us as surgeons to sort of think about in order to organize this in our head figure out what should cost more, what shouldn't cost more, um, and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but even in the short time that uh, Brandon and I have been in practice, we already have a case study on what this could look like, what a new biologic could look like in the market. And this is bone morphogenic protein. Uh, BMP was first approved about 20 years ago, and for about eight or nine years, it was the, the best thing since sliced bread, uh, because it worked in so many different environments, at a cheap fusion, we thought we found the product that would rule all. And this was a golden age. But then we found that because of the way we used it, because we didn't understand the biologic mechanisms very well, that there were a number of complications that occurred. People are even saying caused cancer, retrograde ejaculation, all these issues that have been since debunked. But there is this huge 
sort of backlash after we believe that this product was the best thing since sliced bread. And so it goes to show that um, when we talk about this area, uh, a lot of data needs to be put forth uh, in order to address all of these concerns. Um, a lot of patients' lives were affected by uh, the usage of BMP. I believe that as surgeons, we're a lot better now in, in use of this than, than we were before. But we shouldn't have a curvature of uh, adoption like, like it is here. So if you look at over time, there's a sharp increase in the use of BMP, then a sharp decrease. Uh, this is all overreaction, right? Overreaction in usage, overreaction in, uh, in, in non-usage. And now we're sort of at a steady state. And as surgeons, whether you're in joints, a foot and ankle, however, or spine, however you look at new technology, you have to look at new technology a little bit differently than you do with your own iPhone or your MacBook Pro or what have you. Because the choices that you make for new technology will affect patients. If you just buy a new iPhone with the latest and greatest technology, if that doesn't work, you're not affecting anybody's lives. So you have to think about it different as surgeons. So um, at home, I have a very, uh, a very wonderful family. Uh, as uh, Brandon mentioned, my wife, Erin, is, uh, is a PhD. Uh, she's a bone biologist, and we work together not only at home, but also at work. And so the, uh, we have a unique uh, situation where we have a number of research fellows. These are medical students who come rotate up with us for a year. We have them now all over the country as orthopedic residents. We've been doing this for over 10 years, and it's really this is one of the most rewarding parts of my life is just be able to mentor uh, research students. And then some of them even come in, uh, like Joe Weiner, for example, uh, he, he was a research fellow for, for us and now is going to be a spine surgeon um, uh, after training here at Utah. So at Northwestern, um, we have a unique situation where my orthopedic uh, operating room, my clinic, and my research lab are all within a block of each other. Um, uh, for those who are interested in a career like this, if you don't have that geographic advantage, it's really hard to plan meetings to get work done to move forward. And so I feel very fortunate uh, to be a part of that. Uh, our lab is also part of the Simpson Query Institute, which is one of the leading bio and nanotechnology institutes in the entire country. Um, this new building that you're seeing here is the largest biomedical academic building that was, uh, that was opened uh, two years ago. And um, all of our facilities are, are along this area and we have a this uh, institute is an incubator uh, of sorts where phds um, uh, mds students researchers all get together in order to present um, or in, do research that uh, much of what i'll be presenting today so there are a couple areas that i think um, you know my career has sort of uh, established within bone biology and i like to talk about them individually so if we talk about optimizing um, how spinal biologics uh, achieves fusion, spinal fusion. The first thing we have to think about is the host because we operate on folks with a number of different comorbidities. High BMI, some drug users, smokers we know clearly have an effect on bone healing, diabetes, previous revisions. Uh, the older you get, the harder it is to fuse. And the, these are um, issues that we need to address. And then you're talking about the structure. Everybody's spine is a little bit different. Everybody's degenerative spondylolisthesis is a little bit different. Some people have coronal, sagittal deformity, a high-grade spondy versus a low-grade, multi-level problems, corrective osteotomies. Again, we're demanding more and more from our biologic in order to achieve a good outcome. Smoking, we know, ha we know have a, has a lot of adverse effects, and this ranges from wound infection to poor clinical outcomes. We know folks have more disc degeneration if they smoke. But we're not really sure of how the mechanisms or which mechanism is important for each. And this can come into play if we want our patients to stop smoking before we operate on them. Now, vasoconstriction, nicotine, they have, these have all been proposed as potential mechanisms. But in our lab, we've been doing a lot of studies and we've done in the past in terms of the effect of the toxins of the smoke and not actually anything else. But we know that smoking affects bone healing. So dioxin is a... Um, uh, is, a, is a molecule that uh, 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 stimulates the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, and we know that it impairs bone composition, its growth, remodeling, and mechanical strength. And so this contraction you're looking at here, uh, it's been favorably referred to as a lap bong uh, because you know, there's a cigarette that can be extracted, but we're basically extracting the tar uh, from the cigarette while we smoke it in a hood, and then we inject that tar into animals to determine what that effect would be. 
So if we do a project with or an animal study, which we, ha we have, where we just isolate the toxins, and if that affects bone healing, then it stands to reason that it's the toxin affecting the bone healing and not anything else um, in, smoke, in, in smoke. So we published a paper in JBGS about six years ago where we looked at exactly this, where we, uh, where we injected the toxin into rats, exposed them to dioxin, uh, which is a car carcinogenic um, as well. And we found that um, if we gave them exposure to the dioxin, it affected their fusion rates negatively. But then if you stop the dioxin, you could actually regain some of the bone uh, healing effects. So you could actually, just like how smokers, we make them stop smoking before, uh, before the fusion. And if they started even after the fusion, we, uh, that, that's not good for their health, but at least the bone healing mechanism wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be affected as much. So we concluded um, that uh, the mechanism of bone healing really uh, has uh, an impact on post-operative management and, and pre-operative management. So my patients who smoke, I allow them to take a nicotine patch because in my opinion, it's the toxin that's affecting the bone healing and not the actual uh, nicotine itself. And so we also found through our basic science research that the mechanisms from smoking and renal osteodystrophy are similar. So the way we deal with folks with renal disease uh, can be similar as well. There are many treatment protocols that are available, including the administration of resveratrol that's found in red wine that can help um, mitigate the negative effects of smoking and there are ongoing projects in our uh, lab looking at this. More recently, when we talk about the host, we found some interesting data on the sex-based differences um, in bone healing. And so al although we, as from a clinical perspective, have not looked at the difference in fusion rates between men and women, it never seems, there are definitely controversial studies in, in, the, um, in the literature as, as, of, as of yet. Um, what we can't do clinically is examine what the bone looks like um, after it's healed. So this project uh, compares, the, the images on the left are what a male rat would do in, uh, after exposure to BMP compared to a female rat. And as you can see, the differences in the type of fusion mass is, is, is much different. In the males, you have a much larger fusion mass, but in the females, the smaller fusion masses actually have a higher trabecular bone content. And if you look at the histologic uh, data with male versus female rats, uh, males also have a higher adipocyte density uh, compared to females as well. So this project uh, just indicates that we have a lot to know, a lot to learn um, when it comes to the mechanisms of bone healing for uh, females and males. And this may lead to different types of uh, treatments for, uh, for these individuals uh, clinically. Obviously, it hasn't been uh, correlated clinically, but, but a lot to understand uh, as far as our host is concerned. So moving on from the host, um, if, if we can control our host uh, to a certain degree, now, can we improve the materials that we're administering or giving our patients that, uh, that will lead to, to higher fusion rates? The peptide amplifile is a building block of many different uh, projects within the Simpson, Simpson Query Institute. This is a molecule that has um, a hydrophobic core so that when it's assembled, it forms these nanotubules uh, naturally uh, because of the hydrophobic core. And on the surface, ep uh, there's an epitope that binds uh, any number of uh, uh, growth factors. And so that's why this can be the building block for many different, um, uh, many different applications in medicine. In bone healing, if you can bind something to bone morphogenic protein, which is what this uh, BMP peptide amplifier has, then in essence, you can uh, bind all of the endogenous bone morphogenic protein that's naturally occurring in your body and not have to administer any growth factors, cells, or anything like that, that and still get um, uh, bone healing to occur. So these uh, molecules form these uh, very long um, uh, nanofibers uh, that can then act as biologic uh, activity or induce biologic activity. <clears throat> they form um, uh, networks that are very similar to the natural extracellular matrix. So it tricks the body into thinking that it's already, uh, or is a biologic scaffold, even though it's purely synthetic. And these uh, nanofibers can form uh, uh, many different types of, um, uh, or, uh, make different types of formulations, uh, including uh, being injectable in a liquid, uh, being absorbed into a porous carrier, and then being formed into pastes and pipes. And all of these areas, or all of these formulations, can have different applications, not only in spine, but also in orthopedics. There may be some products that we just want to be in a liquid form. 
others that we want to have cohesiveness and, and have form when we inject them and where when we place them in a posterior lateral setting. And that goes for any area of um, uh, orthopedics as well. If you look at a scanning electron microscope of a network of um, nanotubules that have no epitope, this is what it looks like. So you have nanofibers, you have bone morphogenic protein in the area, nothing's binding to those networks. But then if you have one with an epitope, you can see visually where these molecules are going. They're actually attaching along the nanotubules. Um, in essence, we're hoping that they can be released at a uh, gradual rate, not at all at once. Um, and if you administer BMP in an area without the carrier, then you can have this first release effect that uh, can lead to a number of different complications as well. And so this strategy um, has the uh, end goal of being delivered in an area where we can uh, where we need to form bone and to achieve spine fusion without any additional growth factor, or we could lower the dose of bone marrow <coughs> protein and hopefully obviate the need for any autograft uh, harvest or anything like that uh, for, for patients that could lead to another uh, set of complications. So anyone who is a three-year-old like I do, if you want to look at and illustrate this, uh, at Chuck E. Cheese's, there's this uh, machine called the Ticket Blaster. And so on the left, you can see that the little girl is very uh, distressed because there's all these tickets going all the way around. This is like conventional bone healing. You've got factors, you've got cells, you've got uh, networks. Um, and uh, if you don't have any organization, uh, the kids are going to be very, very uh, upset. But on the right hand side, you can see the exact same ticket blaster in a different environment could lead to a different kind of experience. This boy happens to have a hat where he's taking all the tickets and putting them into the hat. And then at the end, uh, you know, he can use all these tickets to buy the best plastic toys that, uh, you know, the tickets can buy. And so, um, so he's really happy because he has the hat, he has the proverbial hat that can help organize everything that's going on around them um, can then lead to uh, you know, lead to good bone healing or lead to the good mechanism. So this is how I sort of look at the peptide amplophile when it comes to bone healing and when it comes to um, achieving success. So this is one of our early studies in tissue engineering that uh, sort of looks at the release rates of different commercially available uh, carriers. And on the top blue, this is observable collagen sponge, which comes with the infused kit uh, that, that we use in, in spine. And you can see that the, the sponge really doesn't hold the BMP at all. When you put it into an in vitro study, it gets released right away, you know, after uh, most of it within seven days. But if you compare it to a nanofiber gel, you're having a much gradual release over time. And this, uh, in essence, could decrease some of the complications that we see from bone marrow protein, especially within the first 7, 14, 21 days when we administer to our patients, and then uh, achieve a more physiologic uh, bone healing mechanism. One of the early studies, again, this was seven or eight years ago, was in advanced healthcare materials where we looked at uh, a BMP2 nanogel, so it's a binding nanogel compared to both observable collagen sponge and a nanogel that did not have this epitope. And we showed with these early studies that you need the epitope, epitope and you need the nanogel in order to form bone. And so these were clinically or statistically significant, and we were also able to show that in about 40% of in, uh, animals, you could use the nanofiber gel alone and achieve fusion without any sort of growth factor. And at that time, it was the first study to show that you could have a purely synthetic mechanism um, to uh, achieve bone healing. Now, 40% isn't great. It's not like we would use this in a, in, in a human, uh, from, but, it, but it showed that there was this potential that if we modified it just a little bit more that we could get it to form bone. So a rat, that wasn't a rat, uh, we carried it into a rabbit study, which uh, most folks know is, is a much more stringent model in order to heal bone. And these are the studies that um, industry uh, partakes in order to bring a product to market. And so we were able to show with this type of BMP2 binding nanofiber that we could reduce the amount of bone morphogenic protein required to achieve fusion rates in the rabbit that were never seen before. Now, we weren't able to achieve fusion without that bone merging protein. Again, these are just steps along the process that would lead to a commercialization and hopefully re reach our end goal. But it did show that, there, again, there was promise that even though we didn't achieve what we wanted to with growth factor free regeneration, that the rabbit model showed that the efficacy was much better than any other carrier. So there are alternative approaches that um, are, are um, sort of piggy piggybacking off the information that we have from BMP. 
we know that uh, if we have a BMP binding epitope, that uh, the nanofibers will bind this protein. But if we have a heparin binding epitope, we're not only taking advantage of BMP, but also other growth factors that be, can be critical to the bone healing cascade, including fibroblast, or fibroblast growth factor and, and VEGF looking at angiogenesis. So this approach also uses nanofibers, but it takes advantage of the other types of molecules in the area that could then uh, act as a symphony rather than a soloist when it comes to BMP. This uh, was published in Nature about three years ago when um, we were able to create a super molecular sugar in conjunction with the Sam Stoop Lab, uh, who's the director of the Simpson Career Institute. Um, and by creating the sugar, it would, we were able to mimic um, a molecule that could bind a heparin binding uh, moiety or heparin binding uh, uh, epitope. And, and the reason we did this is because heparin sulfate itself has limited availability. It's an anticoagulant. It doesn't have a lot of clinical application when it comes to uh, bone healing because it can create a bleeding environment that surgeons don't want. So if we can recreate that with a, a sugar, and in this case it was a, a, a the synthetic monosaccharide, uh, monosaccharide with a trisulfated sugar, then, um, then we can lead to the bone healing uh, without actually having to use heparin sulfate. So again, um, we use this uh, uh, approach, which is similar to the BMP2 binding epitope, but again, we're, we're binding other types of growth factors. We were able to show that you, we could reduce the amount of BMP in a similar uh, fashion to the BMP2 binding epitope, uh, but then uh, thereby taking advantage of other growth factors as well. So um, uh, was was interesting findings uh, for us, and we and we. Uh, uh, we also catered this study to show that you needed the uh, trisulfated sugar and not a monosulfated one uh, in order to create the environment uh, because if you just had a monosulfated one, it did not recreate the heparin binding sulfate. So then um, those are examples of how we look at materials. Um, the last sort of uh, the frontier of how we can improve biologics is really through manufacturing. And so conventional manufacturing uh, really has a lot of waste and it applies to a different type of uh, product such as a spinal biologic. Whereas 3D printing um, can provide a lot of advantages when we talk about biologics and we talk about incorporation of, of human bone and human growth factors. Uh, 3D printing has uh, exploded in, in our market for the last decade because the patents have allowed uh, us to sort of take advantage of these processes in all aspects of life. And when it comes to um, bone, bone healing, uh, we have a, a very generous collaboration with the Ramil Shaw Lab, who is now at the University of Illinois Chicago, where we were able to test a specific type of ink that could then uh, regenerate bone. So as we know, uh, uh, hydroxyapatite, uh, calcium sulfate, calcium phosphate, these are very brittle materials. But if we are able to combine this material with an elastomer with some kind of mixture, and then print it at an ambient uh, room temperature, then there is an ability in order to, uh, uh, to improve the handling characteristics and then to improve the biologic delivery. So by doing it this way, as you can see in the bottom left, you can create a scaffold that's hyperelastic as opposed to the brittleness of a hydroxy appetite. And the reason is because of the manufacturing uh, layer by layer. The other reason is that it's, uh, it's uh, printed at ambient room temperature, not at very high temperatures that can degrade the material itself. Um, this material is subsequently more absorbent than a conventionally produced hydroxyapatite uh, a scaffold. And um, uh, th these can be printed at very high rates. So, uh, so a number of advantages uh, sort of can be ensued. Um, we published this in Science, the first, uh, uh, the, the, the first study just to show that we can achieve bone healing with this uh, scaffold. What you're seeing the white here is the actual scaffold that has been printed on a layer by layer. This is again a poster lateral rat model. And then the green is the mineralized matrix around the scaffold. So the, the initial studies uh, did include growth factor in order to jumpstart the, the mechanism. But we were able to show that uh, this bone can form within the scaffold and uh, can be done in a, in a manner where the handling properties are, are, are more advantageous. So then the next phase of the study, uh, is in, instead of including growth factor, would be what if we um, uh, incorporated human material into the ink and then use the growth factors from that environment. 
So enter in demineralized bone matrix, which is a product on the market that is allograft based, but it's produced in a way where we can retain growth factors. And in some instances, we can use it as a standalone biologic as opposed to being an extender uh, with local autograft. When we have these products in the, on, the, on the shelf, they're usually included with some type of carrier. Oftentimes, 80 to 85% of the material is a carrier, such as glycerol. It improves the handling characteristics. But if we just use the powder, then we're just using human material, and we can incorporate that, uh, uh, in theory, with our synthetic hydroxyapatite and print a scaffold that now has growth factors, have hydroxyapatite, and have really good handling characteristics. Um, the, um, the key component here is that if you have a mechanism where you can print it at ambient room temperatures, then you won't kill the growth factors. If you need these high temperatures in order to process it, then human allograft really doesn't do anything because by that time, the, any growth factors that you have um, will, be, uh, uh, will be eliminated uh, from that processing mechanism. So this is what the material looks like um, with DBM. And looking at it under a scanning electron uh, microscope, you can see that uh, it integrates within the scaffold quite well. And so the hope is that the growth factors within this area will then be released slowly over time to then re recreate the, the bone healing uh, cascade. Some of our early studies with this uh, uh, scaffold uh, came in tissue engineering. Um, this was from 2019, where we looked at the ideal ratio of hydroxyapatite and DBM. We didn't really know if it was one to one, if it's two to one, if it was three to one. And we were able to show that um, if uh, a three to one ratio, hydroxyapatite to DBM, uh, led to the best fusion rates and the best handling characteristics, and then less led to the best bone integration within the animal model in order to, uh, again, achieve bone healing that's growth factor free. Uh, you don't have to put BMP in that environment um, in, order, in order to achieve that. We were also able to show that without DBM, you don't get the bone spicules that form within the scaffold. And, um, but with just, uh, but, but with DBM, then you were able to, to, to find that. So this uh, micro, uh, micro CT uh, scan with magenta representing the bone spicules represents what can happen if you have growth factors and um, hydroxyapatite within it. Um, we were able to create this thresholding mechanism that could allow us to identify the hydroxyapatite, which is mineralized, versus the mineralized host bone, and be able to quantify that in order to show a, a true effect. Um, another way to think about this manufacturing process that we don't typically uh, uh, think about all the time is the geometry of the actual scaffold, because it's printed on a layer-by-layer -layer basis. So there are a number of ways that we can alter the process, including the uh, macropores, the porosity, uh, the strut angle in which each layer is laid down on a on a layer by layer basis, and then the geometry in which the um, the layer the layers sort of meet each other. Are they offset? Are they non offset? Uh, does it create this randomness enough that that we can create this ideal um, ideal scaffold? And so the next phase of these studies are looking at different um, uh, formulations of the scaffold in order to improve the bone healing process. Again, these are all done in uh, uh, rat models where we alter what the pore sizes are, we alter the strut angles, and then uh, we align or disalign them. And then we were able to show, okay, not only do we have the ideal growth factors that are involved, but we have the ideal geometry of the scaffold, um, as well as proving the fact that it can be handled in a, in a, in a, very, uh, a very, very easy way uh, for the surgeon. One of the um, interesting corollaries from the study is that uh, we, we, we utilized this technique that allowed us to prove that not only is there bone formation within the uh, fusion mass, but there is also angiogenesis that's uh, going on that will then produce the constant remodeling that's required for a mature fusion mass. And so through this microfill technique, we basically inject the animals with uh, this dye right before sacrifice. And after all of the, uh, the vasculature has been, um, uh, been satiated with the, with the dye, we then look at this histologically and are, are able to threshold how much angiogenesis is occurring within that scaffold. So if, we're able to use this with other products as well, but able to prove that not only does a hydroxyapatite and demineralized bone matrix lead to bone healing, but also the vascularization that will then lead to the continuous remodeling of the, of the fusion mass itself. The future um, is still there because we haven't figured it out uh, completely. All, all of the scaffolds that we have talking about may not 
form a fusion mass that is as strong as something like bone morphogen protein. Um, it not, may not be produced in a uh, cost-effective way that could lead to, uh, you know, success com in a commercialization uh, standpoint. So we can combine these methods. A lot of the technologies you heard with peptide amplifiles, with manufacturing methods. Combining these, I think, has a, a very promising effect in terms of getting to that end goal, where we can uh, pr uh, produce and uh, provide uh, this uh, uh, spinal biologic that is completely free of any growth factor. And uh, fortunately, uh, we still have, uh, we still have a, a runway in order to develop this over time. One of the very, uh, uh, one, of, one of the uh, uh, things that I'm really uh, grateful for in, in, in my role uh, here at the Simpson Career Institute is that we have a, you've heard a number of different technologies that have been developed over time. And um, we have products in every different phase of development, whether it's still on the bench, whether it's carrying it to translation. And now we recently have uh, brought a product uh, into the FDA regulatory pathway. Now these pathways are very long and cost a lot of money. And um, uh, so, so we're not quite there yet, but having different products at different phases in different environments, uh, really uh, it, it makes it easy to see how one can have an effect eventually um, if you just keep at it and keep working at it. So, um, so uh, and, and this is, uh, yeah, these are just recent uh, micro CTs that we have from a, a product that we're, we have carried into a rabbit model that will then eventually get to the uh, regulatory pathway. So in summary, um, improvement in the delivery of biologic agents depends on a number of things. Uh, we talked about the host, uh, improving the host that, that, that we operate on, uh, in this case, uh, the, the humans that have made comorbidities. Uh, different advances in materials will allow us to tackle different uh, different projects, different uh, issues uh, when it comes to spine surgery. And then finally, the manufacturing method, we now understand a lot more uh, and have a lot more uh, methods available in order to improve this uh, in the future. Um, I'd like to thank uh, a lot of different collaborators that we have within the group. Um, uh, you, you saw the list of research fellows that have uh, been in our lab uh, for the last uh, 10 or 15 years. and. Um, uh, thank you for your attention and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Well, and first, thank you. It was an amazing talk and an amazing body of work. I, I guess I'd like to take a second and point out what you've done over the last decade or more in, in research. Start with, well, go back to residency at UCLA and the um, in the lab where we, really where BMP was discovered, um, and uh, sort of taking that all the way through to your career, um, and having the foresight to marry a woman who can really carry you along. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, she she did, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, what's really stands out to me is your ability to um, to to grow a path, you know, in your research and to build upon blocks that you built and then build upon those blocks and just to create this longitudinal uh, massive body of work that everybody refers to uh, in, in the further development sort of offshoots of what you've done. Um, and along the way you've, you've garnered collaborators across the country, you've, uh, you've really paid attention not just to the basic science but every aspect of trying to get something into a patient. And we don't always see that. We see people who are really expert in the science part, really expert in the manufacturing part, really expert in the um, sort of getting it out to the world part. But you've been able to sort of bind all those pieces together, which which gives us the ability to actually bring true translational science into into the operating room. And I think it's it's wonderful to see. So I want to compliment compliment you on that. Um, I want to go back to early part of your presentation. I have a lot of questions, but I'll let others ask you. But I'll just ask one right now. Um, smoking. You talked about dioxin and the toxin. Um, would you be comfortable now, based on all that literature, um, getting somebody off of cigarettes and onto vaping, where they get nicotine but no dioxin, or onto nicorette gum or patches and, and feel fine just going forward with surgery? Or do you still try to get them off of yeah, uh, well, thank you for the comments, Daryl. I, I, um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, being able to achieve a lot, I think it really depends on the, the team that uh, you, you build around yourself. And I think a lot of decisions, you know, that I've made in that area have really carried that forth. But, but thank you for those kind comments. Uh, 
uh, without leaders like you, uh, none of the work that we do will be recognized or even appreciated. So, so I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, yeah, this, so uh, so this is how I think about smoking. Um, we, we have some reasonable animal data, in my opinion, to suggest that nicotine may or may not have an effect, but dioxin does have an effect. So the way I look at that is that um, my patients, or the way I use that for my, my practice, my patients can use nicotine gum, the nicotine patches. I have no issue with that. And I don't believe that the evidence is strong that nicotine will inhibit bone healing um, just, just looking at the body of evidence. Uh, the vaping question, uh, and, and then cannabis is another uh, area that we're, we're sort of looking at as well. That deserves its own um, study, which is ongoing, because I think there are a number of effects from vaping, not only through nicotine, but there are other factors with that process that could affect bone healing that we don't really understand. So I don't really tell my patients that they can do all that. I do think that vaping and cannabis are better than smoking. So if somebody comes in and tells me they're doing that, but I know that there's no nicotine in their, you know, their serum, I'm not going to fight that battle necessarily. But I think from a scientific perspective, just because we think that TCDD uh, or, or dioxin in, 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 a, in, a, in and of itself is the cause of the bone healing inhibition, it doesn't mean we should ignore the fact that there are other things with, with smoking uh, you know, that could get upset bone healing as well. Other questions? Uh, <clears throat> maybe, maybe you could talk about the speed of bone healing. Speed, yeah. Um, I think achieving a fusion quickly is what surgeons want to do. Um, but most of the time, what we do takes six months to heal. Uh, e even if we're confident in uh, releasing restrictions for our patients, we freely admit that the bone remodeling process doesn't occur for for at least six months. Uh, you know, when bone morphogenic protein came on the scene, uh, it really changed the way we thought about how quickly bone could heal. And that was one of the reasons why it was such a revolutionary product. Um, we were getting CT scans at a month, two months, seeing bridging bone. Now the bridging bone we didn't understand at that time was changing. So even though it looked mature at four or eight weeks after a fusion, if we did another scan uh, six or nine months later, we could see that that bone actually may resorb and may go away. And, and so we didn't really understand that. So, um, uh, so, so more studies have indicated that this mechanism that bone metric protein you know, carries with is not necessarily ideal. Um, a, a lot of the patients that I treat in my clinic are uh, very, they're, they're elite athletes. They're, they're ones who rely on uh, professional sports in order to conduct their livelihood. You know, their families depend on that. And though that is the population where we need quicker bone healing and we need immediate stability. And th th that sort of need drives what I would recommend, you know, clinically to a patient, uh, you know, if they have that, um, if, if they have that in mind, especially if they're in that situation. Um, but the products that we are developing in the laboratory have that in mind as well. Um, I, I think there is a potential way to provide a purely synthetic biologic that will then allow the body to uh, take over, uh, so to speak, over time and lead to quicker bone healing than we've seen with traditional commercially available products. Um, we haven't quite shown that yet, and that's hard to show in a translational animal model because the fusion occurs so quickly, like in, a, in an animal, like for example, if you just put BMP in a rat, it's up to two weeks that that will form form bone. So it's hard to study that in that environment. But I think once we have a product that we know works translationally, um, we can then sort of tease that out uh, uh, clinically as to exactly how much time we need to immobilize a patient or to uh, you know require instrumentation or to have restrictions on it. Do you think that the will agonists will do accelerate? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. The ones on the market that we have have clearly shown differences in surgical outcomes. Uh, I, I shouldn't say that. Not, not, not clinical outcomes, but uh, have, have shown differences in the ability for the instrumentation to hold over time. Whether that leads to a clinical outcome, I, I, that, that remains to be seen. But I, I think we have to look at that a little bit different from a metric perspective. 
I think, uh, you know, they're like Forteo, all these uh, products on the market are being routinely used at my institution for individuals with significant comorbidities that could benefit from three to six months of treatment before a long deformity construct. Got a question? Uh, Curry, you think that's the hearing loss, right? And you said, do you assume most of your answers are living in animals? If you look at the differences between young and older animals, Absolutely. Uh, great question. We so um, one of the advantages of doing translational work is trying to alter the model so that it becomes more stringent. We've done it where we've compared ages. Uh, we've also done it where we've um, you know done ovariectomies on animals. Um, we've also administered, you know, toxins to these animals and seen how they heal. Um, the age, uh, I guess the age factor in animals, in my opinion, is not as pronounced as it is in humans. Part of the reason is because the lifespan of these animals is a, is a lot different. So what constitutes an old animal versus a, a young animal? Uh, the younger animals have an issue because they're a lot smaller. So if they're smaller, the technical aspects of the surgery are a little bit different than if they're older and usually much bigger. So that, that sort of adds into it as well. Um, I think the age, or in my opinion, if the study is done in rabbits, and if you have the capacity to age rabbits over time, that's where the differences are seen, uh, both are more pronounced that you can actually study and, and, and optimize your biologic in that environment. Um, but that's very expensive. Rabbits are very expensive to keep, and any model that sort of ages the rabbit uh, has, has additional costs, much more cost than uh, with rats itself. So I would say in certain animals, that, that's promising. I think the, the, the other aspects we thought about, in my opinion, are, are even more applicable, are when we talk about cell-based therapies. If you harvest cells from an older animal, uh, and, and the studies here in the Utah you know, have taught me that, that, that if you study in an older animal and older patients, they're not going to be the same as the younger patients and younger animals. There's some controversial literature behind that, but I think mo most would uh, agree to that, uh, that, that fact. So, um, uh, so doing studies in aged rabbits, for example, when it comes to harvesting cells, I think that's going to be, or that has been um, more beneficial than actually testing products um, in, in that environment. Um, we know that dose-dependent <coughs> effects in DMT are, are um, the effects are really different depending on dose and speed of delivery, volume, etc. You see these cavitary, big cavitary lesions. You know when too much DMT has been delivered too quickly. Um, no effect if it's too little, too slow. Um, can you talk a little bit about that dose that that, uh, that dissol slow dissolution, steady, steady state. Uh, volume uh, and your thoughts around how to deliver BMP better. Yeah, um, so Dr. Baraki is, is uh, referring to the fact that as surgeons, um, back in the day, we thought this project was so great, so why don't we just use more of it, right? If we use more of it, maybe we lead to faster bone healing, maybe uh, we get a better outcome. It just stands to reason if you have something really good, you just use more and more of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was wrong, right? So um, I think a lot of the complications, uh, a lot of complications that we've seen with different, not not only BMP, but let's just say like, uh, for example, uh, metal on metal implants for hip and knees. I can't tell you how many metal on metal implants I implanted as a resident, how I was told that it was the next best thing, like it was never going to fail, never going to wear out. And then sure enough, 10 years later, we're taking them all out, you know, like, and, and so I, I think, again, as a resident, you you're going to be exposed to this. That experience has certainly affected the way I adopt new technology. It's not more is better. That, that is not the way that we should, we should do this. And, and clearly, if you have too much of a good thing in this environment, it will lead to complications, as, uh, as, as Daryl mentioned. So, um, so yeah, uh, from the initial studies of BMP, all reasonable surgeons have continued to use less and less and less. And you'll, you'll still find studies that have been, you know, show that people use 10 large kits in a large deformity construct. And yet, uh, you know, the people here are using one kit, you know, and it's still getting the same result. So you can still achieve the same result without, uh, without using a, an enormous amount of, of, of growth factor. It's actually better for the patient. 
So the uh, the release characteristics of that product is uh, is interesting. And so when BMP was released, it was with this observable collagen sponge. But even the basic researchers that had developed the product would tell you, even today, that, that they knew at that time that the carrier was not ideal. In fact, they knew that it could cause an issue if it released the product um, at, at, a, at a, like a burst release, we call it. Yet they still released the product into the market because um, these products have a, a, a window of time with, where they can actually uh, lead to, you know, uh, lead to adoption of use. And at that time, surgeons were clamoring for a biologic. So they decided to release an inferior formulation of this product because that, in their minds, was better than not releasing it at all. And so uh, clearly there could be a better carrier. We've, we've studied better carriers throughout time. But in order for the company to adopt a new carrier and, re, uh, I guess, re-regulate the product, we're talking about tens and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. And no company that already has a product that is selling, you know, at a billion dollars in its heyday, a billion dollars a year, is going to make that investment because they're already, you know, doing very well on it. So, um, so I think, uh, so, the, so the way to answer the question is that we are now much more understanding of what the product is 20 years later um, in terms of what we need to do with growth factors in terms of slowly releasing it over time. Um, as well as, uh, you know, providing, uh, or, or as well as not using as much as we used to uh, and leading to the same clinical result. Yeah, Nick. Uh, thank, thanks for the talk. I, I just had a question, and, and maybe you can make a comment, being boots on the ground in the translational world. You know, what should it take for us to read literature and say we're ready to adopt technology? You know, most of this stuff comes out every year, and it says it's as good as, you know, DBM and the cervical spine, and you talk to people and they like the handling characteristics and you give it a try, but from your standpoint, what should it take or what should we be looking for to say this new bone substitute or extender or is better than the rest? Yeah, great question, Nick, and this, I think it's a very apropos question because um, we as surgeons are now on you know hospital committees, we're trying to make decisions on what products are in the uh, on the shelf at a certain institution, uh, and, and you have to compare different products with different data, historically, recency, and all, all that sort of thing. I think the way I look at it is that it's helpful for surgeons to know the stringency of an animal model when it comes to bone healing. Mice are easiest to heal. Rats are a little bit harder than mice. Rabbits are much harder than, um, uh, than rats. And then the larger animals, such as a sheep in particular, uh, you know, when we talk about interbody fusion, has more applicability to, um, to a biologic in terms of clinical adoption. So if we have that in our mind, then that, that's, the, that's the first start, the framework. Now, you'll have some surgeons uh, be on the podium and say, well, anything heals in rats. So uh, none of that data is really helpful in that environment. I would disagree with that. I think if we recognize that that model is not as stringent as other models, okay, we'll give that. But there's so much historical data as to what the fusion rates are in a rat that you can compare that historical uh, fusion rate with your new product and then determine if it needs more data. That doesn't mean you adopt it into a human tomorrow, right? But, but it, it, it means that there, there, is some, there is something we can take away from that just because of the volume of data that we've had in that particular model. But clearly, if you have a study that is in a more stringent model, then that may be more applicable for uh, for human use, especially when we're talking about like, like for example, if we're talking about an inner body cage and an inner body fusion, that's not going to work in any of the lesser animal models because there's no established model. We're talking about sheep, even you know, pigs and baboons and that sort of thing. So, uh, but but the true holy grail is clinical data, right? We we want clinical data. We need clinical data in order to make decisions for our patients. Um, I would never advocate for the use of a product without that clinical data, but sometimes it's not available. And sometimes uh, products will reach our shelves or reach a, a committee, and we have to make that determination based on the translational data. And as long as, long as we have that framework, we can then, uh, again, if we adopt that new technology, we're not implanting it to every single patient that we need a fusion for. We're trying it in the ideal environment, right? And if that works, then we can slowly build an argument in order to use uh, from, from here on out. And so that's how I would 
sort of look at the adoption of any new technology with any um, uh, with, with any new uh, new product that uh, has never been on the market before. Good question. Any other questions? No, I just wanted to echo what Dr. Bradby said too, and really really compliment you on this sort of body of work that you've established. And and when you think about sort of where we are right now with cell based allographs and the differences in sort of the the kinds of um, strategies that we're trying to use to get patients to heal bone. Um, it's so different than what you've sort of developed. And, 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 and really, I think this is the future, that the use of endogenous proteins in patients um, by, by, by use, using the manufacturing that you talked about and everything is, I think, really the, the, the future. And, um, and, and, and I think that this was a, this was a fantastic talk for, for us. I think for spine, but it's also very um, useful for trauma, for joints, for anything that we're trying to get bone to heal. So I really wanted to compliment you on that and really thank you for, for coming and spending the hour with us. Thank you, Brent. Yeah. yeah. Thank you guys.